The dust has hardly settled at the Pucapunyol military area following the massive training exercises conducted this December. Yet the tremors are already being felt across the entire Australian army. For decades, the silhouette of the Australian cavalry was defined by the ASLAV. Agile, light, and reliable. But as 2025 comes to a close, a new shadow is being cast over the training grounds, and it is significantly larger, heavier, and undeniably deadlier. We are talking about the Boxer Combat Reconnaissance Vehicle, specifically the Block II variant. This is not just a standard vehicle upgrade. It represents a fundamental shift in the doctrine of the Australian Defence Force. For years, critics argued about the weight and the cost. But after seeing the Block II in action during the late 2025 certification trials, the narrative is changing. We are looking at a machine that has transformed from a passive scout into a frontline brawler capable of hunting tanks and swatting drones out of the sky. Today, we are going deep into the specifications, the controversy, and the massive manufacturing milestone in Queensland that has turned Australia into a global exporter of heavy armor. To understand why the Block II is such a game changer, we first need to address the elephant in the room, or rather the 38-and-a-half-ton rhinoceros. When the LAN 400 Phase II program began, the primary criticism was that the boxer was too heavy. The old Aslav weighed roughly 13 tons. The boxer tips the scales at nearly triple that. In the distinct terrain of northern Australia, where wet seasons turn roads into swamps, Mobility is life. However, the logic of 2025 has superseded the logic of the early 2000s. Recent conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East have taught military planners a brutal lesson. If you can be seen, you can be hit. And if you get hit, lightweight armor is a death sentence. The sheer mass of the Boxer Block II is not dead weight. It is life insurance. It provides a level of protection against mines, improvised explosive devices, and ballistic threats that the A's lab simply could not offer. But protection is passive. What makes the Block II the ultimate war machine is its ability to end a fight before the enemy knows it has started. This lethality comes down to the Lance 2.0 turret. This is the heart of the Block II upgrade and the primary difference between the initial vehicles delivered from Germany and the ones now rolling off the production line in Ipswich. The Block I was impressive, but the Block II is fully digitized. It features a new open architecture system that allows for what is known as hunter-killer capability. In practical terms, this means the vehicle commander can use their independent panoramic sight to spot a new target, while the gunner is simultaneously engaging the previous one. Once the gunner is clear, the turret automatically snaps to the commander's next target. In the split-second chaos of armored warfare, being two seconds faster than the enemy is the difference between going home or not. Furthermore, the optics on the Block II have been significantly upgraded to counter the modern battlefield's biggest nuisance, the drone. The 30mm MK-32 cannon is now fully integrated with programmable airburst ammunition. During recent exercises, Cruz demonstrated the ability to program a shell to detonate at a specific distance, creating a cloud of shrapnel designed to shred commercial and military drones. This provides the Australian cavalry with an organic air defense capability they have never possessed before. 
However, a 30 millimeter cannon, no matter how advanced, cannot penetrate the frontal armor of a main battle tank. That is where the Spike LR2 missiles come in. Tucked away in a retractable pod on the side of the turret, these missiles extend the boxer's reach out to five and a half kilometers. This is a fire and forget system, meaning the crew can launch the missile and immediately retreat to cover, or they can guide it manually via a fiber optic link to switch targets mid-flight. This capability transforms the boxer from a reconnaissance asset into a legitimate tank hunter. Perhaps the most critical upgrade for the crew's peace of mind is the integration of the Iron Fist active protection system. Iron Fist uses radar sensors to detect incoming rocket-propelled grenades and anti-tank guided missiles. Once a threat is detected, the system launches a small interceptor to detonate the projectile a safe distance from the vehicle. This layer of hard kill defense essentially gives the boxer a shield against the very weapons that have devastated armored columns in recent overseas conflicts. But the story of the Boxer Block II is not just about firepower, it is a story about Australian industry. Located in Red Bank, Queensland, the Military Vehicle Center of Excellence, or Milvi Kui, has become the beating heart of this program. Rheinmetall Defense Australia has employed over 600 highly skilled Australians to build these machines. This facility is not just an assembly plant, it is a full-scale manufacturing hub. We are witnessing a historical reversal in the flow of military technology. Usually Australia buys off-the-shelf equipment from the United States or Europe. However, because of the high quality of the production line in Queensland, the German army, the Bundeswehr, has ordered over 100 boxer heavy weapon carrier vehicles from Australia. We are effectively building German tanks for Germany. This deal, worth over one billion Australian dollars, validates the quality of the Australian Block II configuration. It proves that Australian steel and Australian engineering are up to the standards of the most demanding military customers in NATO. This export success secures the supply chain. In a potential future conflict where global shipping lanes might be contested, Australia does not need to wait for spare parts to be shipped from Europe. The expertise, the tooling and the steel are all right here in Queensland. This is the true definition of national resilience. Of course, no platform is perfect. There are valid discussions occurring within the Royal Australian Armoured Corps regarding the boxer's footprint. Moving a 38-ton vehicle across the Pacific to support island hopping campaigns requires significant naval logistics. It demands heavy landing craft and robust infrastructure at the destination. This has led to intense debates on forums about whether the Army has prioritized protection over deployability. However, the counter-argument is that reconnaissance in 2026 does not mean sneaking around. It means advancing into contact and having enough firepower to force the enemy to reveal their positions. The Boxer Block II is built for exactly this aggressive style. As we look ahead to 2026, the rollout of the Block II will accelerate. We will see more squadrons converting from the ASLAV, and we will likely see further evolution of the platform. For the Australian soldier, the Boxer Block II represents a quantum leap in survivability. For the taxpayer, it represents a hefty investment of over 5.2 billion Australian dollars, but one that has birthed a new high-tech manufacturing industry. What do you think about the trade-off between weight and protection? Is the 38-ton weight limit going to be a logistical nightmare in the Pacific, 
Or is the heavy armor worth it to bring our diggers home safe? The German army seems to think the Australian-made version is the best in the world, but I want to hear your take. Leave your thoughts in the comments below, and if you want to see a deep dive into the specific mechanics of the Iron Fist protection system, make sure you subscribe 